Okay, we're back here live in Las Vegas for IBM IOD. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined with my co-host Dave Vellante. We'd love to get the experts and the authoritative figures on theCUBE, CEOs, entrepreneurs, but more importantly, we'd love to get the analysts on here because analysts will tell it how it is. Judith Hurwitz, uh, President and CEO of Hurwitz and Associates. Welcome back to theCUBE, CUBE alumni. Um, getting Dave, <laughs> doing, doing the CUBE with Dave is fun for me because we can just ping pong back and forth and pass shoot score. But when we have another analyst on, you, when you've been on, when Ray Wang's been on, when Merv's been on, it's been really awesome. So thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Um, so, okay, so give us the scoop. What's the take? Give us the, give, give us, give us the, the, the quick first inning overview of today yes. for IBM. So, so it's, it's interesting because what I'm seeing is, is these elements starting to be brought together, hardware, software, uh, a lot of the, um, issues around analytics, uh, visualization, big data, predictive analytics, uh, cognitive computing, pure data, all of, um, uh, I really like the, um, the blue um, announcement. The uh, Neo? Col uh, the columnar, uh, you know, database oh, the announcement. Data store. With, uh, with blue. Um, so I, uh, you know, uh, also bringing in, you know, um, um, analytics from a manageability standpoint. So you've got people, you know, out of the former Tivoli organization, CL, whatever, CIA, no, not CIA. NSA? What, what are those, <laughs> NSA? <laughs> I forget what What's they call it now. Talk about cognitive computing. What's going on there? What, is, what do you mean by that? So cognitive computing brings together big data, machine learning, predictive analytics, um, and it starts to, to take all these things together so you're not just looking at what question to ask, but you're looking at patterns and you're seeing sort of what's similar, what's associated to what, what's the context, and that starts to get very powerful as a solution mm. in various industries. So that, that's going to be sort of the next stage beyond big data, and, and I think that uh, that's going to be extremely important. It builds on it. Yeah, I was going to ask you, is that a solution? And that's exactly what you're saying, is yeah. bringing all these, because it feels like you got a lot of point products going on, and right. you know, a lot so of little innovations popping up all over the place. Sounds like but, cognitive but computing brings it all yeah, together. Yeah, cognitive computing does, because it, it really then allows you to start looking at it from a knowledge base. So whether it's in, you know, healthcare or engineering or, you know, um, uh, manufacturing, uh, to start putting the pieces together to understand next best action, what this means, what it's telling you about what you should be doing in the future, just for you know diagnosing illnesses because there's, you know, part of this is when you look at answers to questions like what's causing this disease, you bring your biases into it. Um, it could be a disease that you've never seen or hasn't you know occurred in your country, but your patient may have been to some country that you have no idea what diseases are rampant there. So it, it really sort of brings in a combination of automation combined with you know knowledge coming from lots of different sources. So you guys wrote the book, uh, the Big Data for Dummies book. Right. Um, and of course, things are moving so fast here, but when you, when you wrote that book, it was starting to become clear that all the big players were going to get involved, whether it was IBM or yep. Oracle or HP. They've all got their big data, EMC, they've all got their big data data plays. What have you been tracking now? What's sort of changed since you wrote the book and, and what do you so, see going forward? So, you know, forward? It, it's interesting because in some ways um, a lot has changed, in some ways nothing has changed because, you know, when, when you look at something like big data, you can get, you can look at all the concepts, but how do you actually implement that? What does that actually mean to real customers? Because, you know, as industry analysts and people, you know, who watch this industry, you assume that, well, everybody's already down the maturity curve and it's not true. A lot of companies are either just getting started or, and what's, what's happening a lot, the companies that are doing a lot of work in this, they're doing this in silos. They're doing it in projects and business units. So now we actually have the issue, and this is one thing that I'm tracking, is now all of these silos, we've already had a lot of data silos, but now we have big data silos. And there's also the issue of when you go and grab all these sources and you use Hadoop and you go get all of these big data sources, they're, they're not clean and you start to bring them in 
and do you have one version of the truth? So you might have one department that's done a big data um, analysis who, who has now taken some, uh, some line of business data and some, some of this data from third party sources that bring them together. This is what they're doing their business plan on. You've got another unit that's taken a different approach. So now you've got multiple versions of the truth. And is, you know, uh, they were talking this morning about veracity. And that's actually going to, I think, rise as a much more important issue. So big data sources, by their very nature, are dirty. You know, if it's, if it's um, social media data. It could, it could, some of the results could be that company planting a lot of information about isn't, isn't this service great, we're so happy. Um, how much of what's out there is somebody who's disgruntled and is just saying things that may not be true, but they just, they're mad. They're just putting out data. So how much of that data is good? How much of it is junk? How much, you know, really is meaningful to what customers, let's say, are really saying about your products? So you, yes, you want to grab as much data as possible, but that's why we we talk a lot about going from big to small. It's the small data that's really important to you. Not the the big data is just your starting point. So you see an information quality pro, uh, problem oh, yeah. brewing oh, out ab there. Ab so absolutely. What's the answer? Is that a, is that a process issue? Is that a technology issue? Combination? Well, it's it's a combination. It's it's being able to sort of start off with a lot of data sources, but understanding that they're not clean and then culling from that, where are my patterns, where are my anomalies? And when you get to that s set of data, then you want to look at context. Is, this, is there actually a correlation here, or is it just something that, you know, I, I noticed that, that uh, people who buy toilet paper also buy blue pens. They're, they're, you know, it seems to show up. Is there a correlation? Does it make any sense? No, it just, it's just, it just happens. So you have to make sure that what you're looking at as an association, as a correlation, actually is meaningful, or is it just sort of one of those things that, that happened? And that happens a lot. So in thinking about how information quality problems were solved in, in traditional BI and enterprise data warehouse worlds, I mean, ERP obviously helped a lot, but even, in, even with ERP, sometimes you had certain systems that are sure. more up to date than other systems, but at least there was knowledge of that discrepancy. It, it feels like with, with big data, and particularly with social data, you know, you hear about info streams. I mean, this stuff is happening in, in real time. How are organizations going to solve that data quality problem when everything is so fuzzy? Do we have to change the, the mental model of what is quality? Well, no, no, I, I, I don't think you change the mental model. It's when you get to that subset of data that, that is meaningful, either because there's a pattern there or something that doesn't match the pattern, then you have to apply data cleansing and, and tools that, that look at master data, that, that look at governance uh, requirements. I think the, the other thing that's really important here is that when people are looking at huge amounts of data, and they may be taking data that's been masked, that, that where there are regulations that say you can't show social security numbers. A lot of times when data is being moved into for, you know, ingested for big data analysis, it unmasks the data. So all of a sudden this data in flight is now unmasked, and, and in terms of governance, that's something that people have to pay attention to. The governance question came up, Judith, about um, iteration. You know, it sounds a lot like the agile startup, but you know, one of the customers uh, on here said, hey, you know what? The idea of pulling back, getting it all together, reviewing it, and then unleashing it is the old way. And that data quality always creeps into it no matter how good you it clean has the to, data. Yes. So there needs to be a process of getting it out there and then managing the data kind of in real time. Well, you, managing the data in real time and making sure that that masking doesn't go away as data is in flight because it... So what do customers do? and What's their choices? I mean, do they have any options? Is it simply a vendor issue? Is, it, is, there, is there an open source technology? What's that look like? I, I think it's a vendor issue. I think you have to Just look... Just pick the right vendor? Yeah, I think you have to look for vendors that are aware of that issue. You know, when you op use open source, for example, you have to make sure that when you use that, you use it with, you know, in combination with a vendor that understands, you know, the governance issues that you're required to follow. Is this, is this a tempest in a teapot, or is this going to be the way it's going to go? No, they, it's going to go this way. 
um, you know, you you can't put the big data genie back in the bottle. <laughs> you know? well, we, uh, <laughs> data in three. Like, well, we heard <laughs> the data genie, although we want three wishes, though. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, number one, make wishes. the big data go away. <laughs> we, you know, we, heard, we heard in New York last week from uh, one of the CTOs, when, once the data tap gets turned on, you can't turn it off. No, you can't. And, and what happens is then people want more data. And where that will act actually lead us is to data visualization. Be because you know the the more data you know you start to collect and then then you know not, now it's not just this little pot of data that you want to look at it's, it's now now it's actually really big and um, actually my first experience with this uh, was uh, infinity pharmaceutical in, in the Boston area mm -hmm. they actually we did some work with them years ago where what they were doing is they would take huge um, amounts of data about molecules that might have an affinity for each other. And they used a data visualization tool to see where these clusters of affinities were. Uh, if you didn't do that, there was no way that they could go look at everything. Oh, does this one like this one? So <laughs> that's a way of, of using visualization to, in effect, control the fill rate of the data lake or data ocean. Right, right, exactly. It. So visualization, I think, will become the front end to big data. So, you know, everybody talks about putting uh, data, big data analytics in the hands of business users beyond just the, the power analyst. It, it, is, isn't visualization sort of yeah, the path Yeah, I, I to think visualization that? is. I also think that we will have to get to areas of abstraction. Because if, you know, I always, when, when people say, we're going to need 300 million data scientists by the year, you know, 2019. If we actually do, this industry will have failed. Yeah. Really, yeah, right. be, be, because if you don't have layers of abstraction that, that abstracts a complexity, we will never have, we'll never have enough data scientists. So you'll know that right. the industry's really made progress in terms of maturation when, when you don't need so many data Yeah, you're scientists. saying data science doesn't scale. It doesn't, effect. it doesn't. Data scientists. Well, we know. You, you know, when the automobiles first came out, the biggest problem that people pointed to, will we ever have enough chauffeurs? <laughs> really? No, no, that's that exactly, was, that's that, a was great the, that was going to be yeah. the limiting factor in how many automobiles An would be bought. <laughs> Another great soundbite. <laughs> so, so, so again, but again, last week to bring the data point from from Big Data NYC, our event we had last night, which um, Strata had an event kind of with us as well, same time uh, was. This estimated about 20, 200,000 data scientists out in the global market. About 200,000, give or take a few here or there, um, and two million analysts. And mm -hmm. that number is understated. So I think this notion of knowledge worker we were riffing earlier was, that was the nirvana of the 90s, the knowledge right. worker. Now, you can shake your phone and get analytics. So the, the iPhone and the edge device. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, and there, there are definitely issues there. Uh, I had, um, knew some, know somebody uh, working for a company that will, you know, is doing one of the social media campaign for scientific data. So they went to Google Analytics, because these were sci you know, science types, and they said, Look, our Google Analytics score didn't go up. How come? You know, and, and it's, you know, this is not, a, you know, it's Google Analytics is not a science. It's sort of a There's a lot of gamification yeah, yeah. going on. People are trying to yes, game the yeah, system. Yes, they are trying to game the system. And they just change the algorithm, then everyone who's gaming it, I So get how me. come, you know, if we, now that we have, you know, 14 tweets, how come our score didn't go up? <laughs> you know, so, so. It, it's, it's sort of a, a, a funny world right now. Yeah, it's kind of like market share data. Right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's never gained, is it? No, never. Never, I didn't think so. How about this idea of a chief data officer? That's come up a, a bunch of times today. Um, we heard it at the MIT conference. Do you see that uh, as a role that is going to emerge? And will that role be reporting into IT? Will it be distinct from IT? What's your take? Um, I actually think that it will be in part of IT. But, but it'll be more of a committee uh, between the, because, you know, it's an IT issue in terms of data cleanliness, getting the data sources in, manipulating them, security. abstracting them, the security, but it's not just an IT issue. It really is a combination of what IT does and, and, and what, what data the business needs. And sometimes I won't even know what they need. Um, you know, if you know exactly what question to ask, you probably don't need big data. Because, you know, your universe is small enough to know exactly where the data is and you know exactly what to ask. 
But if you're in an uh, ever-changing market or very competitive market, you know, you're not, you're, you know that there are a lot of sources and it's figuring out what new sources you need to bring in. So the idea of the chief data officer, I think it's, too, it, it, it's just a pipe dream. So why do you say it's a pipe dream? Too early? Or they, it's un, it's I, inferred? I just, it's inferred because, it, be, because requirements? it's not just one person. What, what does a chief data officer do? Let me go see if I can find some more data for you. You know, no, you can't do that with the data. What's their job? Kind of like and hiring I, social media consultants in 2009. Well, in a they don't know, they in don't know a, what to do because it hasn't been in, done yet. In a regulated industry like financial services and government and healthcare, the the job is to cover your butt. But but then you know that's the you know chief security officers is not isn't that their role? So how is that? Only you know? in part, right? Because there's data quality issues, there's mm -hmm. data governance, yep. information management. Certainly, security, data science. Yeah, you could, you could expand that role. That's a but. But again, is that job. one? Is that well, one? Well, I think what she's saying, what she's saying is the use cases are not defined, so you're essentially it's a moving train. Um, and what you're saying is that you can limit the scope, like a chief security officer would say. Your job is to protect the assets. Yeah, but well, I think but, that's the, a big but but question, how can right? you is, how can you isolate that? Okay, I'm I'm only concerned with the security of the a, data. It's a slippery slope. I'm concerned with the, the making sure I have the right business data. Some, so, 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 you know, maybe it's a team of people. I think it's too big. It's depending on the industry and the individual. Dave Lav Laverty talked about today. Who owns the data? Was it IT or the business unit? And it's you a know, squabbling that's, match. He said we, nobody owns the data. Everybody no, owns I'm, the data. No, I mean, and, and it becomes a political issue. I mean, yeah, very uh, much so. You know, if, if you look at, you know, the life sciences industry, it's been political for decades. Wait a minute, that data is mine. Oh, but, but I'm trying to, no, you can't have it. It's my data. It's from my clinical trial. You can't have it. I mean, yeah, but so been, you'll never get to a single version of the truth without some kind of standards. Well, you'll never get to things. a single version of the truth anyway. What's yeah. truth? Yeah, I mean, we've, we're further away than we've ever been from a single yeah. version of the truth. Yeah. Yeah, but nonetheless. And it's going to get worse before it gets yeah, better I because we right have so that. many silos. How about privacy? I want to ask you about privacy because, particularly in financial services, you hear about the three big use cases: are, are risk, which really credit risk, uh, 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 marketing, let's sell some stuff, right, and and fraud, you know, fraud detection. And particularly, you know, the, the credit risk is interesting because you now can infer from data race, religion, sex, obviously. I mean, so many different things that you're not supposed to use to make a decision right. about credit worthiness. Then there's some law that says you can't do that. Is this going to be self-policing? Will, will organizations actually I, be trusted to do that? I mean, you know, I, I think it's it's the wild west right now, and I don't think I don't think we've solved that yet. And I think you know, I think people will go. I mean, look at look at Facebook with with some of the mm. issues they've had. So some of it will be the marketplace and and the consumers pushing back. So I think it'll sort itself out, but right now it's going to be the wild west because you can't. You know, you can figure out just about everything. So what's some of the stuff that, that Hurwitz is working on? Um, some of the cool things that you guys are doing? Well, um, we are doing a new study on uh, predictive analytics. Uh, we came out with our victory index on predictive analytics two years ago. and We're updating it now. So that's going to be exciting to see what customers are. D we, we look at it from a, um, a variety of perspectives, what customers are saying. You know how these vendors are presenting themselves uh, to the customers. What the value they're offering, um, and and you know how what's what's their vision for the future. So we'll be redoing that. We're doing um, a uh, a smaller study, you know, a quick study on maturity uh, in in big data. Uh, looking at a, we we just uh, we actually just uh, came out with uh, a new uh, paper about uh, security in the cloud. Um, that we just did in, in you know, sponsored by IBM. We talked to a bunch of uh, customers about how they are, are uh, using, you know, security in context with really customer-facing uh, cloud uh, services. What do you make of, a, of, of IBM's, you know, cloud play? They obviously made a big move with, with SoftLayer. Yeah, um, I think SoftLayer is, is really will put them in a very strong position. It's a very strong offering because it allows you both to use multi-tenancy and, and, and to be um, on bare metal. So it's, it's a very strong yeah, management, platform. management, bare metal. But, but now, so 
and, and it was a big hole that they had to. It, in, it in was a big hole. But some have said, including John Furrier, well, it's really just hosting. You're talking soft layer earlier. I'm not big on soft So you're not layer. sold on soft no, layer. Not at all. I'm but not I, I'm pretty positive. Judith's pretty positive. Why yeah, are you I'm, not sold I'm on it? Yeah, I'm positive on it. I mean, I'm, why well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not negative, negative, but it just doesn't feel $900 million for essentially a hosting company. Um, I don't have all the data, so well, I'm just well, shooting you know, at, at the you, moon here. You, but you have to look at what do you mean by hosting. A cloud, uh, a cloud solution is hosting. I mean, with, well, with I, I'm, it depending I'm, again, on the automation. I'll trust you guys. We'll talk about it yeah. more. Well, but, is it self-service? No, can, it, can, it, can it be on-demand pricing? But if you I look mean, at does it have those cloud-like attributes? That's yeah, what I look no, at. It smells like the cloud. It quacks like a cloud. <laughs> it, it does quack, quack like a, <laughs> quack. a cloud duck. You'll agree with that, right? Yeah, I didn't quack realize like that quacking was a technical <laughs> but, term yeah, in the cloud now, but I will take your word. We're going deep here. Okay. But it doesn't smell like software-defined data center. Okay. You think about virtualization, you're talking about commoditization, horizontally scalable, integrated stacks like we see the success with Amazon. You really having. think there's a software defined data center right now? No, but we do a lot of research looking at software defined networks. I, I think looking Amazon at virtualization is. And, do you and think Amazon no, is not? No, I don't. No? I, 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 I don't. I think that basically it's a bunch of instances. Um, they, they do have a certain amount of, of manageability, but I, I'm not sure that. You know, if you think about the way a lot of people use Amazon services is because it's it's cheap, and I say that yeah, in okay. quotes, uh, depending well, it's on... it's easy. It's, it's easy. It's easy for if a developer. You're a developer. It's from, so they're winning the developer and market. it's cool. They're losing the SLA yeah, the developers market. Love no, no, they're winning the developer market. Well, have you market. ever read their SLA? Yeah. It has yeah. three yeah. words yeah. in yeah. it. Not yeah. my problem. <laughs> well, some they don't have SLAs on some of the high-end computes. Yeah, side, but you but, know what, though? But, I, 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 I challenge anybody to go find a better SLA for a public cloud. I mean, they all stink. No, there, right, there is the the. Go S ask Terramark what their public SLA is. They can't even get it. No, the <laughs> the, the, the SLAs for these companies are written by a lawyer to right, protect exactly. that company. Yes. They have right. nothing to do with, with the actual protecting service level and with the with with how the customers protect or, it. But, it, but it's right. It's an indication of how much risk the lawyers are willing to let the company That's take. That's right. So to me, it's it's largely meaningless. It does. It's not an indication of it's what not, the it's not an actual service level is. It's not an SLA. Right. It's, I agree. It's legalese to protect them against yep. anyone saying, "I'm down. It's your fault." Yeah, Pay they're basically me. meaningless because they yeah. can't, you know. But right now, expose I mean, right, right, now the a huge right, right now the conversation is soft layer Amazon. Amazon, from a developer standpoint has a lot of seamless capabilities, very scalable. A lot of the stack that they have is integrated in. For, but from a developer, software developer, it's a dream environment. From an IT <laughs> rolling it out as an enterprise, whole different ball so, game. So so there's no purpose built hardware no. on, on, on Amazon that I know of. No, it's, I call, right. I'm calling it the so iPhone, that's why I'm saying iPhone of the defined. data center. That is truly, Oracle will never be that. Although Larry Ellison claims he's the, he's the iPhone I, I of the data I will maintain center. that, that, that um, Amazon is wonderful for picking up services, doing things yeah. fast. They have done a wonderful test job dev. on test, test dev. dev. Just like VMware was yeah. five yeah. years ago. Right, right. Do you, it, so you, exactly. do you not see it evolving beyond that? Amazon, I, I would not put it past them to yeah. evolve, but today I also think that if you want to deploy something really big, if you're offering services to your customers uh, for a fee, then it's going to be very expensive. Oh, and I agree with that. Rental from Amazon is, is always going to be more expensive than Right, and you, you than, know, than it, it, looks, it looks cheap from, from at the outset. The other thing that companies are contending with is that there are bits of Amazon all over their enterprises, and then how do you, how do, you do governance on that? Because they don't even know where it is. And well, they don't know what's running on it. So Amazon would disagree with that. So I used to have that, I, I've said that before. And Amazon would say, we have the transparency to be able to let you know in fact, you know what they said? They said that before you deploy an S3 instance, you have to declare where you want it to go to reside. Yeah. How now, it can't how reside in Germany. So in Germany, they no, make no, it, they, no. they allow and it to I'm, reside in That's not what I'm saying. I, I'm, okay, I'm saying something different. So I am the CIO. Right. And there are, and, and there are 85 di divisions in my yep. company. I get it. Yep. Yeah, it's a and, nightmare. And, you know, a bunch of them it's are, you know, I'm exactly doing right. a pilot project. Yeah. Turns out that it's going to be something that that's you know really strategic IP, 
It's out there. Yeah, and it's yeah. and it's and, and it's I'm different. And I'm the CIO. And it's outside mm -hmm. the scope of correct. your governance, you know, criteria. Right. And and it's not necessarily bad or, or good. It's just but then, different. Then right. it yes. comes inside totally my agree. governance, yeah. and the okay, CIOs but how, don't but know what's But that's not it, that's not Amazon. That's any cloud. Would you agree? Depend. It depends on the cloud and how it's managed, and and now what the, the difference is. is the question. Now help me help me with this. The difference is IBM would say. We'll write the SLA however you want us to write the SLA. Or we'll, do, we'll work with you hand in hand I, to change I think, that. Whereas I think Amazon that say, here's our SLA, take, take it, it or, or leave, leave it. it. Yeah, that's the difference. And it depends what your use case is. If your use case is, I'm doing pilot projects, I'm trying out things, um, and, and it's fine because, and then when I'm putting it in production, um, I'm I may move it inside because I'm going to actually, ch you know, uh, something like a State Street or a big corporation that doesn't have direct customers, but they provide services to companies who then provide it to their customers. Do you yeah. want to have that overhead of paying in addition to your own infrastructure that you're going to support? Yeah, right. Then you're going to pay well, a fee to Amazon, and then you. I agree with that. That's where Amazon's challenging. When you want to bring it back on premise, that, Amazon's right. not going to help you facilitate right. that in the way that maybe IBM would or you know another yeah. on premise provider. Yeah, I would. mean I Their I, bet I think is that, keep it in the cloud. I think that we're still, you know, we're still early with yeah. with with the what cloud. What do you think about IBM's social business um, manifesto and their position that they're coming out with? I mean, they've been down this road before. We love Lotus Notes, all that. They have had a lot of efforts going on, unified communications going back yeah. you know many many years. They're not new to the Technical well, I mean, if if, concept, if you if you look at their overall strategy and and what they're doing from um, a software perspective, it's not anymore these separate, independent, standalone products. It's really infusing social media in into big data solutions, into commerce, into you know whatever the particular solution is. So I think it's a much better approach for them than trying to, you know, um, uh, compete as, you know, with the uh, the small, you know, yeah. social media companies. It makes a lot more sense. They seem to bundling it in, but I mean, they have yeah. a great vision. I mean, yeah. I mean, IBM. No, I think the vision's good. They have a lot of experience internally. Mm -hmm. The whole unified communication thing just seemed like a legacy PBX market. You know, they seem like they were always incrementally bolting on to voice over right. IP. Yeah, and, and I think they had trouble with of that. Um, I, I do think, um, I think connections has 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 actually gotten some um, some traction in the market. I'm starting to see, you know, there are a bunch of companies in the collaboration space that are trying to be aggregators, you know, of of uh, of you know of different platforms, bringing them together, adding governance or whatever uh, to it, and they're starting. You know, so so they're telling me that you know connections is starting to pop up as an important platform. Yeah, how about cl cloud brokerage service? I don't know if you saw the service mesh, uh, CSC bought service right, mesh. Right, right. Do, uh, do you expect more of those types of deals? Is that a key, you know, acquisition? You mean from a broker standpoint? Yeah. Yeah, I, th uh, I think so, but it'll probably be uh, a few more years before that's sort of the norm. But I, I, I think it has potential. Have you been tracking though. the whole uh, Pivotal thing, the, the what I call the misfit toys that they ultimately that's did? That's a, a good way to say it. A great financial yeah. move and stick it under, you know, yeah. Pivotal. And, Get a hundred million from GE, and all of a sudden they get a billion dollar valuation. I mean, a brilliant financial move, but great financial largely move. Largely Green Plum still, right? Yeah. In terms of yeah. revenues, but I what, mean, but Green, green Plum or? has has a good reputation. Whether you can take Green Plum and um, and all of the you know open source Cloud uh, Foundry, stuff, and Cloud Foundry, and, and, and um, Spring, and Gemfire, <laughs> and Gemfire, and, uh, Gem, uh, Gemfire and SQL Fire, and bring it all together and have something cohesive. I guess I'm still um, a little skeptical. Yeah. Maybe more than a little skeptical. Yeah, like ways to go. That's it. One dot o is not there yet. So. Okay, yeah. guys, great. We're on time here. We're getting the hook here. So this has uh, been a great conversation. Final um, word give to, to Judith. What should the folks expect to hear for the next next day or two here at the, at the IOD? Um, what are you expecting IBM to talk about? And what do you think that's going to connect into into the marketplace? Well, well, I, I think that we're seeing a lot of it now. It's it's bringing a lot of threads together, not as many you know small little little um, uh, products. We're announcing version you know 4.6.2 up. You're seeing a lot more sort of um, solutions focused, 
a lot more uh, customer centric, outcome centric. So, so I thought, you know, I like the fact that the messaging is much more around, you know, customer facing, outcome facing. So I think that you'll hear a lot more of that, you know, bringing together, you know, governance, uh, manageability, uh, uh, predictive data, uh, beginning of discussions around cognition, which, which we'll see a lot more of. Okay, the analysts break it down, the horses on the track, horses for courses, as Dave would say. <laughs> this is theCUBE, love the analyst action. Of course, we'll always have our commentary and opinion here in theCUBE. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. This is theCUBE live from Las Vegas, IBM's exclusive coverage of IOD, hashtag IBM IOD, this is theCUBE, we'll be right back. <laughs>